Hello all and welcome to my channel. I'm Carrie. Ah, love and courtship. They draw us into reading modern romance novels, to watch rom-coms, and retell and refashion our favorite stories from classic literature. After all, love and courtship are the primary plot points of all Jane Austen's novels, right? Well, this video is part one of a two-part series on courtship and marriage in Georgian England. If I try to cram it all in one, we'd be here for hours, folks. So in this first video, I'm going to explore why women got married and the trials and tribulations of getting to a proposal that produced so much fodder for Austen fanfic and Regency romances like the Bridgerton novels. I'll cover coming out into society, meeting eligible men, and the rules of courtship, or lack thereof. Part two will cover getting engaged, the actual wedding, and being married, and then, you know, if things go wrong, divorce. As usual, I'm going to use Austen's novels along with other writings of the Georgian period and look at modern retellings and other historical dramas to answer the question, was all this worth it for women? Yes, sometimes love was the primary incentive for a wedding, but there were other reasons women signed that marriage license. Marriage during the Georgian era in England was ostensibly more about love and less about arranging alliances and controlling inheritances than it was in the past, but money was still very much a factor, especially for women in the upper classes who were, for the most part, not able to work for any sort of profit and therefore were dependent on the men in their lives for support. Support. Jane Austen herself is a great or sad example of this because she never married and was thus financially dependent upon her father until he died and then relied on her brothers as did her mother and sister. She eventually made some money through her writing but it was never enough to support herself. The equivalent of about 45,000 pounds in today's money between around 1811 and her death in 1817. If she had lived past the age of 41, perhaps she could have experienced independent wealth, but we'll never know. Austen's own financial fragility permeates most of her plots, wherein the heroines and their families are staring down the possibility of insolvency. The unmarried Bennett, Dashwood, and Elliot sisters were all in danger of living out Austen's own financial dependency. Marriage, as Edward Copeland notes, was her narrative mainstay, and that it was was a legitimate and common means of gaining access to all important capital for a woman in her time period. The narrator of Pride and Prejudice tells us that Charlotte Lucas, without thinking highly of men or of matrimony, marriage had always been her object. It was the only honorable provision for well-educated young ladies of small fortune, and however uncertain of giving happiness, must be their pleasantest preservative from want. Love is great and all, but choosing a spouse is a serious thing, especially if you can't make money for yourself. Lizzie Bennet knew Wickham was a poor financial choice, even though she liked him, at least before Darcy's letter, that is. Same thing with Colonel Fitzwilliam. And Anne Elliot was persuaded to break her youthful engagement to Captain Wentworth because he had no fortune, yet. His future prospects were uncertain, and he had nothing but himself to recommend him. Sure, his career took off and he returned a very rich man, but we can't fault Lady Russell and Anne for being cautious. As Amanda Vickery states in her article, No Happy Ending, at home with Miss Bates in Georgia and England, Austen's own life and the disappointments of her female friends and relatives scorched the message that financial independence was the be all and end all. No funds, no choices. Emma Woodhouse has plenty of both. Emma is the only Austen heroine who professes a disinclination to marry, unless of course she falls in love. And this is because she is rich. As she tells Harriet, fortune I do not want, employment I do not want, consequence I do not want. I believe few married women are half as much mistress of their husband's house as I am of Hartfield. And never, never could I expect to be so truly beloved and important. So always first and always right in any man's eyes as I am in my father's. Emma has the freedom and privilege of wealth to support her blasé attitude towards marriage. When Harriet expresses astonishment that Emma is okay with becoming an old maid like Miss Bates, Emma tells her, never mind Harriet, I shall not be a poor old maid and it is poverty only which makes celibacy contemptible to a generous public. A single woman with very narrow income must be a ridiculous disagreeable old maid. The proper sport of boys and girls. But a single woman of good fortune is always respectable and may be as sensible and pleasant as anybody else. Well then, no wonder Jane Austen joked that no one would like Emma but herself. 
Emma's diatribe against spinsters and continual contempt towards Miss Bates reflects the societal prejudice against unmarried women long past their freshness date on the marriage market. And we're talking late 20s here. The 1737 conduct book by Thomas Reed entitled The Whole Duty of a Woman or An Infallible Guide to the Fair Sex containing rules, directions, and observations for their conduct and behavior through all ages and circumstances of life as virgins, wives, or widows. And the title even goes on from there. And what was I saying? Oh yeah. This book discusses three acceptable states and conditions for women, virginity, marriage, and widowhood. And you might be thinking some women could just stay single and celibate their whole lives and live in peace, right? Nope. Reed declares, woe to she who remained unmarried, an old maid is now thought such curse as no poetic fury can exceed, looked on as the most calamitous creature in nature. Spinsters were considered unnatural and were believed to become ape leaders as punishment in hell upon their death for not marrying. Perpetual bachelors were also denigrated for their marital status, or lack thereof, and were called vermin of the state. Georgians in general perceived older, and again when I say older I mean late 20s and beyond, unmarried women as unseemly in part because many were poor and depended on family and failing that society for their up, but also because marriage was the means of becoming a fully realized adult. So if you skipped over that stage of life into spinsterhood at age 28, you were considered pitiable, contemptible, and downright disgusting if you acted like you were still a young maiden on the marriage market. Unmarried extroverted women who still enjoyed on social gatherings, dressing up and dancing, were harshly lampooned and belittled in satire, cartoons, and even novels. Never mind that eligible men were relatively scarce due to the Napoleonic Wars and that 25 to 30 percent of aristocratic women remained unmarried. As the narrator states in Mansfield Park, there are not so many men of large fortune in the world as there are pretty women to deserve them. Is it any wonder Jane and her sister Cassandra internalized some of this cultural loathing for spinsters and preempted abuse by donning very modest and spinsterly attire in their late 20s? And that Jane used Miss Bates as a comedic element in Emma whose title character has to grow up and refrain from using the poor woman as a target for her contempt. Charlotte Lucas escaped ridicule and abuse from her brothers by marrying the obsequious Mr. Collins, which tells you just how much she wanted to escape a spinsterly future. The ladies of Fleng Wafflin, Lady Eleanor Butler and Sarah Ponsonby, escaped the possibility of marriage to live together in seclusion for most of their lives, and became famous oddities for this bizarre behavior that subverted heteronormative wedlock on purpose. Never married folks were pitiful and assumed to be miserable, and we still deal with vestiges of these social perceptions today in the pressure to get married and have kids. Avoiding scandal was another possible reason women would marry given Georgian society's harsh rules for the proper behavior of young women that left very little room for mistakes, which of course happened frequently. I mean, we're talking about mostly teenagers here, leading plenty of ladies to seek out or agree to marriage to avoid scandal and ruin in reputations and prospects. According to birth and marriage records from parish registers, fully 30% of babies were born within seven months of marriage, and not all of them were premature. While some of this sex before marriage could have been because of the nature of engagement, which I'll get to in part two of this series, it seems likely at least some of these pre-wedding conceptions happened before the sperm donors proposed, and perhaps precipitated that process. In James Woodford's diary of a country parson, he writes, Road to Ringland this morning and married one Robert Astick and Elizabeth Howlett by license, Mr. Carter being from home and the man being in custody, the woman being with child by him. The man was a long time before he could be prevailed on to marry her when in the churchyard, and at the altar behaved very unbecoming. It is a cruel thing that any person should be compelled by law to marry. Yikes. Austin's novels contain unwed pregnancies, but only in the background, and none of the women manage to get married in time to save their reputations. In Bridgerton, Marina Thompson is desperate to get married before her pregnancy shows, to avoid social ruin, which befalls her anyway when she is betrayed by a friend. But even if nothing leading to pregnancy actually happened, young ladies had to be careful about even the appearance of impropriety and were admonished by any number of conduct books to steadfastly guard their virtue. Which Daphne Bridgerton apparently forgot when she rambled in the dark walks of Vauxhall Gardens without a chaperone and ended up in a precipitous and awkward engagement with Simon Bassett to rescue herself and her family. And I shall be ruined. 
this won't be all. Lydia Bennett was particularly reckless, and although she was only 16 when Wickham whisked her away to London, neither she nor her family would have been socially forgiven if Darcy hadn't basically bribed Wickham to marry her. Marian Dashwood was also 16 when she and John Willoughby acted as though they were on the brink of announcing their engagement, but of course, they never did. She gave him a lock of her hair, he called her Marianne, they wrote to each other, took long drives away from Chaperone's eyes, and he even took her to his future home, again without supervision, where anything could have happened. Perhaps because she was a member of the lower gentility of meager means and lived in the country, Marianne's behavior did not lead to her ostracization, but rather sympathy when Willoughby revealed his engagement to another woman. I think Colonel Brandon would have proposed even if she had been shunned from society. And finally, Mariah Rushworth threw caution and everything else to the wind when she ran away with Henry Crawford, who did not marry her as she expected, and she ended up essentially imprisoned with her cantankerous Aunt Norris. No, not that Mrs. Norris. People also married to have children, and not just any children, but legitimate heirs. I mean, this was legally the primary purpose for marriage, to pass on whole estates, and was obviously more important for the upper classes. In fact, it was absolutely crucial for the aristocracy to maintain their influence, wealth, and power, which is why Bridgerton's Duke of Hastings' refusal to conceive a child was bizarrely ahistorical and took me right out of the story. Inheritance and primogeniture were important plot points in all of Austen's novels, and if couples did not produce children, or no male children, this often created complications like an estate and title going to someone outside the immediate family, for example Mr. Collins and Mr. Elliot neither of whom are portrayed as particularly deserving. Presumably, couples also just wanted to have families, like Daphne and Bridgerton, who is inspired by the joy her own mother takes in her children. But we don't see much or any of that in Austen's novels, possibly because the author died a maiden aunt herself, although she did love many of her nieces and nephews. Children are mostly troublesome in her novels, like the Middleton children in Sense and Sensibility and the Musgrove youngsters in Persuasion. Jane Austen knew or knew of quite a few women who died during or soon after childbirth, including at least three, possibly four, of her own sisters-in-law, and many neighbors. Here's an excerpt from one of her letters to her sister Cassandra. I believe I never told you that Mrs. Coltard and Anne, late of many down, are both dead, and both died in childbed. We have not regaled Mary with this news. Mary Austin was her sister-in-law and, I believe, pregnant at the time. Estimates vary wildly, but the maternal and child mortality rates were much higher than they are today, and childbirth was the biggest health risk for Regency-era women. So many have speculated Austen did not want to get married even after getting engaged and then breaking it off the next day to avoid such a fate. Young adults ostensibly had choice in who they married and did not legally need parental approval once they turned 21, but parents, guardians, other relatives, and friends were still a huge influence on choosing a partner, or at least tried to be. Daughters were expected to be dutiful grateful and bend to their parents' will, but Austen's novels are filled with heroines who push these boundaries. Lizzie's refusal to marry Mr. Collins in the face of her mother's tearful and angry admonitions <laughs> is a testament to the strength of her character, although many in her time period might have thought her ungrateful and would have agreed with Mr. Collins that she was unlikely to get a better offer given her financial situation. And we can't really blame her mom's anxiety, although she could have expressed it less ridiculously. Mrs. Bennett was desperate to secure her daughter's future in a patriarchal culture that would give their home to Mr. Collins and not her own children just because of their sex. In persuasion, Anne regrets caving to the influence of her father and Lady Russell, who encouraged her to break off her engagement to Wentworth. But she, too, eventually chooses love over Mr. Elliot, who would inherit her father's title and estate. In Mansfield Park, Sir Thomas tries to cow his niece, Fanny, into accepting Mr. Crawford's proposal. I mean, this is downright emotional abuse, and she stood up to it, if tearfully. I had thought you peculiarly free from willfulness of temper, self-conceit, and every tendency 
to that independence of spirit which prevails so much in modern days, even in young women, and which in young women is offensive and disgusting beyond all common offense. But you have now shown me that you can be willful and perverse, that you can and will decide for yourself without any consideration or deference for those who have surely some right to guide you, without even asking their advice. Sir Bertram's diatribe is on par with those of villains in Gothic novels like Anne Radcliffe's classic, Mysteries of Udolpho, where the scheming Montoni tries to push Emily, the heroine, into marrying the dastardly Count Murano. Coercion into marriage was a common horror plot point in these popular novels of the 1790s and 1800s. Sir Thomas goes on in his portrayal of Fanny as anything but a dutiful niece by telling her, you only think of yourself and are in a wild fit of folly throwing away from you such an opportunity of being settled in life, eligibly, honorably, nobly settled, as will probably never occur to you again. This was a visceral fear among many young women that they would never have another proposal and lose their chance at marriage, and no doubt led to many hasty decisions in favor of a wedding. Fanny was not one of them. When she still refused to accept Mr. Crawford, Sir Thomas banished her to Portsmouth to bring her to her senses. Even Lady Bertram adds to the guilt tripping when she tells her niece, it is every young lady's duty to accept such a very unexceptionable offer. If anyone thinks Fanny is wishy-washy and weak, they need to read or reread that novel. She stands up for her beliefs throughout the entire thing and ends up with the man she wants her first cousin. Can you think of any male characters in Austen's novels who had to deal with intrusive family influence and in their choice of marriage partner? Let me know in the comments below. I can think of at least seven. Austen deals primarily with the gentry and lesser nobility classes. In Bridgerton, Daphne is plagued by her brother's interference as he attempts to control who she meets and interacts with and then arranges her marriage with a man she dislikes. And she basically agreed to this marriage to save her reputation and her families when gossip saves the day. It is true that arranged marriages lasted much longer as a practice among the aristocracy where more land, money, connections, etc, etc were at stake. I'm sure there are other pe reasons people in the Regency got married, but let's move on to the steps necessary for a woman of the gentry or nobility to reach the state of wedlock. And first up we have the coming out or come out, where she would officially transform from a girl to a piece of meat on the marriage market. Let's return to Mansfield Park for clues to Austin's own perception of, or dare I say, annoyance with, the whole process of coming out, or whether a girl is or is not out in society. Mary Crawford asked the Bertram brothers if Fanny Price is out. I am puzzled. She dined at the parsonage with the rest of you, which seemed like being out, and yet she says so little that I can hardly suppose she is. Edmund a man, tells her, my cousin is grown up. She has the age and sense of a woman, but the outs and not outs are beyond me. And then Mary tells him it is usually easy to figure out. Manners as well as appearance are generally speaking so totally different. Till now I could not have supposed it possible to be mistaken as to a girl's being out or not. A girl not out has always the same dress. A close bonnet, for instance, looks very demure and never says a word. Girls should be quiet and modest. The most objectionable part is that the alteration of manners on being introduced into company is frequently too sudden. They sometimes pass in such very little time from reserve to quite the opposite, to confidence. That is the faulty part of the current system. One does not like to see a girl of 18 or 19 so immediately up to everything. And perhaps when one has seen her barely able to speak the year before. A girl not out in society was considered a child, unavailable, and as such was excluded from any social functions. And when present, was expected to be silent and not attract attention. While Edmund might think Fanny is an adult, it is clear from the novel that most of her family does not, at least until Sir Thomas returns from a long absence in the West Indies and marvels at her appearance, observing with decided pleasure how much she was grown. He later throws a ball in honor of her and her brother William, and the occasion is essentially her coming out party, or come out. There was no official procedure for a girl's come out, and individual families chose when their daughters could do so, usually between the ages of 15 and 18. Most of Austen's heroines and female characters are already out at the beginning of the novels. Like all of the Bennet girls, ranging in age from about 15 to 21 or so. Eleanor and Marianne are about 19 and 16. Emma Woodhouse is in her early 20s, 21 maybe, or 20. And Anne Elliot is 26. 
Fanny Price and Catherine Moreland are the only two we see go from childhood to adulthood, or in Catherine's case, to about 16 or 17. And there was no grand occasion for Catherine. She was just allowed to go to bath with the Allens. And Fanny, well, Miss Price, known only by name to half the people invited, was now to make her first appearance and must be regarded as the queen of the evening. Who could be happier than Miss Price? But Miss Price had not been brought up in the, to the trade of coming out. And had she known in what light this ball was in general considered respecting her, it would very much have lessened her comfort by increasing the fears she already had of doing wrong and being looked at. In other words, if Fanny had known the ball was her come out, she might have felt too nervous to even attend herself. Some girls got balls or got to go on a trip to London or Bath, the primary marriage market, while other young women just started accompanying their mothers on morning calls, a very time-consuming aspect of social life for women, and other young women marked the occasion by simply pinning up their hair, which signaled their maturity. Hmm. Being out meant these women could now be invited to and attend social functions, and eligible bachelors could attempt courtship. In fact, the basic purpose of a come out was to allow the parents or other chaperones to put their daughters in the way of as wide a variety of suitable men as possible and hope they'd get at least one offer they would accept. The London season was considered the best opportunity for upper-class young ladies. Usually starting in November to January and ending between May and July, it was the part of the year members of Parliament were expected to be in London and often brought their families to town with them. All of these people needed to be entertained, so there were lots of dinners, routes, suppers, balls, trips to pleasure and tea gardens, and other social occasions where women could see and be seen by potential suitors. Daughters and new wives of peers, like Daphne Bridgerton, could participate in one of the Queen's drawing rooms and get presented at court to Her Majesty like we see in the Netflix adaptation. Well, sort of like that. Young ladies did not have to be presented at court, nor did they need to do so before they were officially out, but if a girl did wish to be presented, her mother or other previously presented woman, relative, friend, chaperone, whatever, would have to sponsor her by sending a notice to the Lord Chamberlain that the girl was ready, and he would reply with a date and a list of requirements for dress, including the number of feathers. Court gowns during this period were uh, bizarre, pairing the fashionably high waistline with distinctly obsolete hoops. The Persian ambassador to Britain described ladies at court in 1810 as standing from waist to toe in full-blown tents, while from waist to shoulders the gowns were closely fitted. All of the Regency-era gowns included petticoats, usually white satin, along with draperies or skirt overlays, a train of specific length, a bodice, and headdresses with feathers. The descriptions of gowns in the drawing room following the marriage of Princess Charlotte to Prince Leopold in 1816 reveals that all of the gowns worn by unmarried girls at their first court appearance contain elements of white, but over half of them included more colorful elements. The Honorable Miss Townsend wore a petticoat of white satin, embroidered border of green wreaths, draperies and white net, embroidered in green satin sleeves, <laughs> and ornamented with blonde lace, and white and green flowers. The Mrs. Thornton, I'm assuming there were two of them, wore robes of pink and white striped satin, trimmed with blonde lace, petticoats of white satin with pink gauze draperies, festooned with bunches of variegated flowers. And Miss Cox wore a white satin petticoat with gauze drapery, decorated with bunches of violets, and a purple striped gauze train. These gowns were extremely expensive, especially for gowns one could only wear to court unless they went through significant alterations. In the 1801 novel Belinda by Mariah Edgeworth, Belinda's aunt lends her 200 guineas, the equivalent of somewhere around 16,000 pounds in today's money, to buy gowns to wear to court functions, including her presentation at the Queen's next drawing room. Court gowns were much prettier in the 1820s after Queen Charlotte died and her hoop requirement with her. There were no drawing rooms between June of 1810 and April of 1812 because the king was ill and the queen only held them irregularly between 1812 and her death in 1818. So they were often well attended or one might say over attended. There was crowding, parking was so terrible, some ladies got out of their carriages and walked the rest of the way, and people were then stuck promenading outside the palace until they could either get in or they could escape in their vehicles. 
The drawing room on June 26, 1817 was so crowded and hot that several ladies fainted and one gentleman also fainted. The Queen received presentations from 2 to 5 p.m. that day, three hours in that hot room. The young women were called in one at a time, and the Queen often spoke to each one of them, then kissed them on the forehead. The girls could not look behind them or turn their backs to the Queen, so they had to walk backwards down the long room, a feat of courage and dexterity if ever there was one, in those awkward gowns. Perhaps the hoops helped a bit by keeping the skirts farther away from the legs? Fanny Burney writes in her diary of kicking out her skirts behind her as she slowly made her way out of the Queen's presence. Backwards. I have not been able to find any extant English court gowns from this period, although they may exist and I just haven't put in the correct magical search terms in Google or databases through my university. I suspect there are a few to none because they were very special occasion gowns that only resemble main fashions of the time if you have a concussion, and therefore are likely cut up and re-sewn to make them wearable outside of court, and to conserve expensive fabrics and other materials. Anne Elliot, as a baronet's daughter, is the only main Austin heroine qualified to be presented at court, but we don't know if she got that chance. She seems too practical, but her sisters likely would have demanded such an honor. Charlotte Lucas is the daughter of a knight, Sir Lucas, who talks incessantly of his own presentation at St. James Palace, but never his wife's or daughter's, possibly because they could not afford the correct attire. Either way, the majority of young women did not anoint their come out with a court presentation. Coming out and participating in all the social functions with the gowns and travel was expensive enough. Mr. Bennett was thrilled to let Lydia go to Brighton with Colonel and Mrs. Forster at so little expense to himself, and no wonder, with five daughters out. <laughs> Most families with multiple daughters only had one on the marriage market at a time to allow them to financially recover in between. Lizzie defended her family's decision to have all five Bennett girls out at the same time, but she might be ignoring the financial side of things a little bit too much. Your younger sisters, are they out in society? Yes, ma'am, all. All? But all five out at once? Oh, that's very it was also just socially awkward for a younger daughter to be married before the elder because it puts them in a socially superior position. I mean, Lydia got married for a laugh and to lord it over her sisters. After being out for a few seasons with no acceptable proposals, many young women began to fear a spinsterly fate and were often on the shelf to allow younger sisters a chance. Charlotte Lucas was on the shelf at 28, so her sister Mariah could come out, but Charlotte still attended local balls and parties, so it did not make much of a difference to her social life other than garnering pity and disdain from some family and neighbors. Once a girl was out and could attend every dinner party, supper party, rout and ball in her neighborhood and beyond, within her family's financial means, of course, she was still restrained by cultural expectations in her pursuit of love and marriage. The shift from primarily arranged marriages to those of personal choice left parents, guardians, and chaperones scrambling to maintain some control, lest their daughters make disastrous mistakes if left to their own devices, like Lydia. Conduct books, one of, if not the most popular genre of Jane Austen's lifetime, gave advice to the unmarried on how to judge character, attract the opposite sex, behave in public towards the opposite sex, and even how to properly propose or refuse a proposal. In A Father's Legacy to His Daughters, published in 1774, John Gregory states, one of the chief beauties in a female character is that modest reserve, that retiring delicacy, which avoids the public eye and is disconcerted even at the gaze of admiration. He would have heartily approved of Fanny Price. Apparently, women were expected to passively wait for pursuit by an acceptable suitor without actively encouraging that pursuit. Jane Bennett is very good at this, and while she ends up with Mr. Bingley in the end, her passivity leads Darcy to convince Bingley she does not care for him, and he aborts his courtship and heads to London with no view of returning to Netherfield. The ever-practical Charlotte Lucas, with all of her unproductive experience on the marriage market, describes how dumb these restrictions on women expressing themselves truly are. But it is sometimes a disadvantage to be so very guarded. If a woman conceals her affection with the same skill from the object of it, she may lose the opportunity of fixing him. There are very few of us who have heart enough to be really in love without encouragement. In nine cases out of ten, a woman had better show more affection than she feels. 
Okay, so women were encouraged to hide their feelings until they were secure of a proposal. And here is Charlotte proposing an overexpression of feeling to fix a man. Marion Dashwood might have been less hurt by Willoughby's betrayal if she had been more sensible in her manner until he proposed. But where's the narrative fun in that? There were many very specific rules for the unattached, many of which are broken by Austen's characters. Don't write letters to each other until you are engaged. Don't use first names. I shall agree on one condition. You do not understand, Your Grace. That you call me Simon. Don't go out of sight of your chaperones. Don't speak to someone you haven't been properly introduced to. Don't reveal you are smart. Don't pay compliments. And definitely don't do that. John Willoughby is a rake because he ignores a very important rule laid out in Jenner's 1810 publication, A Selection of Letters on Life and Manners, wherein the author admonishes young men to not mess with a young lady's affections if they do not intend to propose. Were he to act in the same manner in his common transactions with mankind, his character would be forever blasted. He goes on to write, A woman is often placed in a very delicate situation. She may be distinguished by a kind of attention which is calculated to gain her affections, while it is impossible to know whether the addresses of her pretended lover will end in a serious declaration. So what could they do? The men could pick ladies to whom they paid their addresses, and ladies could refuse the addresses of those they did not like. Well, sort of. Politeness demanded men speak with women at private balls and parties, and women to at least listen. They could converse on suitable topics, whatever those were, and they could dance. Trains on dresses are annoying, but they were a convenient signifier of a lady's willingness to dance. If she pinned up her train, it was a nonverbal cue she was ready to dance. And she could only refuse a partner at a private ball if she was already slated to dance with others, or if she did not intend to dance at all. But dancing held the greatest potential for approved intimacy with eye contact, hand touching, with gloves on, and body language. Hence the narrator in Pride and Prejudice states, to be fond of dancing was a certain step toward falling in love. So was finding a suitable match. And what made a suitable match? In her 2016 book, Courtship and Marriage in Jane Austen's World, Mariah Grace lays out the three C's of eligibility, compatibility, cash, and connections. You'll notice love and passion are not on that list. Young women and men were advised to find someone with whom they could be friends and live with long-term in a domestic situation. Can he love her? Can the soul really be satisfied with such polite affections? Friendship and domestic harmony were thought to be more enduring than the fiery passions of lust and love, and lead to happier marriages. Mr. Bennett married his wife for her vivacity and pretty face, and look how that turned out. No mutual respect. Lizzie found Mr. Collins laughable and then odious once he proposed, and rightly rejected his proposal to avoid marrying someone she could not respect. And by the way, she did so in a polite manner, as instructed by conduct books, to avoid bad feelings and being gossiped about. However, her politeness led him to think she wasn't really rejecting him, hence his continuing until she quite forcefully told him no. And the more tolerant Charlotte scooped him up because she was willing to be irritated in exchange for financial and social security. In Letters to a Young Lady, published in 1811, John Bennett writes, It were absurd to think of love where there is not some prospect of a decent provision for your probable descendants. In other words, it's stupid to get married if there's no chance of having enough money to support your family. The practical could be unromantic, but it can lead to more secure and contented future. Lizzie liked Wickham before she knew the truth about him, but she also knew such a match was impractical due to the lack of fortune on both sides. Mary King was sent away from Maryton in the same novel to avoid throwing herself away on George Wickham, who seemed to be making a game of attempting to marry young heiresses like Miss Darcy. 
Willoughby ultimately could not marry Mary Anne because his aunt threatened to disinherit him if he did not choose a wife with a fortune. Frank Churchill had to wait for Mrs. Churchill to die before he could make his engagement to Jane Fairfax public to avoid being disinherited. General Tilly booted Catherine Moreland out of Northanger Abbey, sending her home the cheapest way possible when he found out she was not the great heiress John Thorpe led him to believe. And Lucy Steele very quickly switched her affections from the honorable yet disinherited Edward Ferrars to his newly rich brother Robert. Can you think of any other courtships in the novels that were aborted or stalled due to lack of funding? That last C, connections, has everything to do with rank, which certainly exists in the US and modern England in the form of socioeconomic status and celebrity, but was much more relevant and nuanced during Austen's time. Just like many of the wealthy today want to maintain their wealth and power by influencing legislation that benefits them and exacerbates income inequality, the aristocracy, nobility, and gentry wanted to hold on to their own pecuniary and social power. And so matches of similar rank were the most common. Pride and Prejudice is essentially a fairy tale, a Cinderella story where a woman of the lower gentility and little means is sought by the grandson of an earl with a large fortune and estate. Significant differences in rank were seen as inappropriate in a marriage and could drag down the family of higher station, like Mrs. Price in Mansfield Park. It was quite common for first cousins to marry. They were most often of similar rank and their marriage conveniently kept the money and estate in the family. It seems incestuous to us today, but Mrs. Bennet was totally on board with Lizzie marrying Mr. Collins. He was the heir to Longbourn, meaning she and her other daughters would be less likely to lose their home after the death of Mr. Bennet. I haven't dated in 25 years, and I thought dating was difficult then, but it doesn't hold a candle to Regency courtship, or lack thereof. The strictures on young people created so much potential for miscommunication, misunderstandings, and the constant puzzling out of the other's feelings and intentions. Tensions. No wonder courtship comprises a great deal of the emotional and comedic plot of Austen's novels. So many details of the books highlight the ridiculousness, the covert, the subterfuge, and the maneuvering of Regency courtship. Like Mr. Elton's riddle that he gives to Emma, who of course thinks it is for Harriet. Harriet struggles to figure out its meaning and Emma must tell her, but Emma is not so smart because she doesn't realize Mr. Elton is actually courting her. Which of course leads to a hilarious surprise proposal seen in a carriage. Which by the way, these two should not be in alone together. And then Emma thinks Frank Churchill is courting her when in fact he is trying to hide his secret courtship to Jane Fairfax, eventually shocking all of Highbury when he announces his engagement after Mrs. Churchill's death. And of course, Emma thinks she might love Frank Churchill, but by the time she finds out about him and Jane, she realizes she actually loves Mr. Knightley. So she is only superficially offended. And towards the end of the novel, thinking Mr. Knightley now loves Harriet, Emma gets a sudden proposal of marriage from him, the work of the moment, the immediate effect of what he heard on his feelings. In fact, there are several surprise proposals in the novels. Like Darcy's first proposal to Lizzie, that was kind of out of nowhere, except that he stared at her a lot. Wentworth's to Anne at the end of Persuasion, and Edward's to Eleanor in Sense and Sensibility. You, you, you mean my brother, you mean Miss, Mrs. Robert Ferris. In none of these do we see obvious courting until the actual proposal. And is this courtship, or is Austen just critiquing and satirizing a process that requires such subtlety and finagling, women might not even realize it's happening until a guy pops the question, and they have only the power of refusing? What do you think? Let me know in the comments. And if you've made it this far, thank you so much for watching. Please like, subscribe, and tune in next time where I'll be covering being engaged, getting married, and getting divorced in Jane Austen's England. Thanks, bye.